I first met Karen Marr in Bologna during the consensus conference on CCSVI ultrasound. I was amazed by her expertise and into the nuances of the ultrasound examination. I can think of no one uh, more suited to invite to give this talk than Karen Marr. Karen will speak about the technique of CCSVI ultrasound. Hello everyone, I'm Karen Marr. I'd like to thank Dr. Scalvani for asking me here to speak today. Um, I am from Buffalo Neuroimaging Analysis Center, known as BNAC in Buffalo. Um, okay. And I have no disclosures. I'm here to talk to you about the techniques in ultrasound. Um, that's a, a long topic, and I also want to show images of anomalies and venous um, abnormalities that I've noticed. So I kind of combine the two talks and so we'll go along with it. When we're doing a venous scan, um, we are looking for at the internal jugular vertebrals and deep cerebral veins in both the supine and upright position. Um, we're assessing the hemodynamics, which is assessed by the presence, absence, and measurements of reflux, bidirectional flow, blockage, stenosis, septum flaps, annulus, um, cross-sectional area, uh, time average velocity, and blood flow volume. Um, I've placed septum and flap together because on ultrasound you'll notice on some of the images you cannot exactly tell whether it's a flap or whether it's a true septum. You know there's a defect there, you know it's causing a hemodynamic change. But some of these um, septums are so thin and if you don't get the exact angle, your angle of inc incidence to the beam, you cannot exactly show it. But you can tell by the changes in the wall um, if they don't um, dilate. Um, if they're not, if they're non-compliant, there's usually a reason. If you don't see an annulus, usually it's because a septum is holding the wall together. So we'll go through that later. Um, usually ultrasound is used as a first diagnostic test. This is because it's um, a real-time imaging. It's inexpensive, cost-efficient, and non-invasive. And in the future, it's going to indicate CCSVI and angioplasty treatment. Okay. Right now, this is presently under research mode, also using diagnostic. Research for assessment of a patient, um, obviously you just have to meet your research criteria. You have, and you're, as the stenographer, you're limited to asking your patient just whether they're able to be in the supine position for an hour, okay? Diagnostically, if you were doing this test, you would like to find out the EDSS scoring, um, CO history, COPD, because that'll have a factor. Uh, congestive heart failure can change your study. Um, their MS classification would be interesting to correlate. And if they've had prior CCSVI treatment. If they've had prior CCSVI treatment, you're also going to look for thrombus, OK? Now, because this is under research, but also the Union of Phlebology has um, noted a doc consensus document stating that CCSVI is an actual um, symptom. Um, around the world, CCS, um, CCSVI scanning is going under, under research parameters. Right now, for CCSVI, it's just a color Doppler um, assessment with um, CSA measurements. Our center, we also do velocities and volumes, um, resistive indexes. So we're going to look at both these factors. For those of you who do not know the original criteria, I don't want to go through this, so we'll probably go through it later on, but just so you know, there are five criteria. Two out of the five are po make a positive CCSVI study. Your instrument setup, you need an ultrasound unit that has high resolution Doppler. Triplex scanning is a must. These are veins, they're very small. There's multiple veins in an area. You're specifically targeting one. Your hand, the patient just breathes the wrong way. Your hand just moves slightly. You're going to be in a totally different vein that could be flowing in a different direction. So you want to be in triplex mode to be sure that you're on the correct vessel. Uh, video capability. Um, as you'll see later on, I can show you a septum in, in a still image. Probably won't mean a thing. You show a video clip of this um, flap or septum, um, the valve totally different uh, predicament for the reading 
position. Um, you need a 5 to 10 megahertz linear probe for the extracranial. You need a 2 megahertz probe for intracranial scanning. And you need the probes to be ergonomically friendly for the um, vascular technologist. You also need a hydraulic uh, chair or a stretcher. You need to place this patient in upright and supine position, so 0 and 90 degrees. You don't want them exerting the effort. You need them so that they're comfortable. So the, the hydraulic chair is, is ideal, but not everybody can afford a hydraulic chair. A stretcher works. Okay, your ultrasound gel, water soluble, hypoallergenic, medium density. How do we? Pointer? Oh. This is very, very important. Your gel has to be warm. You can, if anybody who has done DVTs or anything, you put cold gel on the skin, the vein just goes <laughs> like that. It reacts to the cold. You need warm gel when you're doing these. You need towels and a skin marker. Uh, subject preparation, we need them to have at least 16 ounces of water within the two hours before we start the exam. We need them hydrated, okay? Open neck shirt or blouse, no turtlenecks. We talked about that yesterday. No chains or necklaces. This makes a preparation to the patient easier. No gum chewing, okay? Uh, a lot of these um, MS patients will come in with candy or, or gum chewing. Um, make sure you don't want to choke your patient. And no, we use the protocol of no steroids within 30 days. Steroids can affect the results of your exam. Um, and no air travel within 24 hours. Again, the air pressure, the pressure changes. Patient positioning. Patient, the study always begins in supine position, okay? This is mainly for your CSA, um, your delta CSA factors. We need um, patient supine position. Obviously, when they come in, they're sitting on a chair. You put them into supine position. You cannot start your study. You have to wait a minimum of two minutes. The body has to change for the hemodynamic flow. So you need that two-minute wait. You need the head in a neutral position, no hyperextension, or, or underextension, you need um, no right or left turns of the head. If you're used to doing carotids, that's the first thing you do to a patient. You turn them to the side so you can get to the carotid easier. No, we need them perfectly neutral position. Um, the muscles affect the, the compression on the vein um, directly. That's why we want no head turns. Okay, now we get to the assessment of the jugular. Your patient's all set up, gelled, towel around their neck, protect their clothing, you're ready to scan. We start scanning in transverse. We use grayscale first. We start at the highest level we can see, okay? You, so which is your mandible. You're going to get up to that level because then you lose sight of it and your um, jawbone's in the way. And all the way down to the subclavian. When you're scanning that, you're looking for any B-mode abnormalities. You're looking for flaps, septums, webs, annuluses. You make a whole sweep through to check for that, okay? And there you s you'll see the, that's the left facial vein entering. Okay, left facial vein entering the jugular there. Okay, and then this is just a lower image. Okay, so this is jugular carotid. You're looking grayscale. This is where you're going to see your um, flap septums, whatever's happening. And you do that all the way down to the subclavian. Now you're going to check again in um, color. You're going to look for the patency. You got the whole lumen. You're going to look for flow patterns in the tributaries. And you're also going to look to see which is the narrowest. Again, you're just going to pan from top down in color, okay, just to check it and look for collaterals at the same time. There's your facial vein entering. This picture I put in because it was very interesting. Um, and this happens uh, not commonly, but it'll be a, a reason for bidirectional flow later on when we get talking about it. This is your thyroid vein coming in. It actually comes in longitudinally. You'll see it comes in at an upward angle. This is also, um, this patient had thyroid collaterals. So this thyroid's entering. Okay, now when you think about it, you have your jugular coming down. You have your thyroid coming in, which usually comes in like this to flow downwards. Now all of a sudden you have a collateral that's larger than it should be, okay, coming into the jugular and it's flowing up. It's flowing upwards. So it's like a jet stream coming into the jugular. You're going to have bidirectional flow. Doesn't mean that it's not CCSVI. It's just a cause for it. And if this has enough force, it'll, it'll, it'll bidirectional jet stream right up as far as we can see it. Okay. All right, next. Now we're going to measure um, 
your CSA, when you pan through in your color, you've noticed, okay, where's your, your narrowest point? We measure it in color flow. I will show you an image later on why we do it in color flow. A lot of places just do the lumen. Um, we'll talk about that later, but right now, this is where you, you find your narrowest point and you measure. Right here is the jugular. This is the carotid, and right there is the jugular. Okay, so this is measuring 3.41. Okay, we're in supine position here. When you take this measurement in transverse, you will mark it on the skin. Okay, you need to remeasure that at that exact location when you turn your patient upright. So you need to mark it on the skin. Okay, now you're going longitudinal grayscale. Here I'm showing you, this is actually the valve coming down here. This is actually a septum that goes right across, okay? You'll need to verify anything you see in grayscale, in transverse and longitudinal, okay? It's just a verification. And again, you document and you're assessing your um, valve here. And here's another septum going right across. This septum is actually below your valve, okay? Um, it's still important because what this septum is doing instead of the function of, of the jugular is also a reservoir, okay? You get too much blood flow, so it dilates open. And, and when you're watching these, they wax and wane all the time because that's the purpose of them. All of a sudden, you have a septum going across. It can't. It's like f holding it there. It's not that it's non-compliant. It, it, it is in a way, but you can still see it going like this, but it can't open up, okay? So again, that's affecting the flow. This is, I think, um, I'm not sure who talked about it yesterday. I call it a segmental block. It's just my terminology. I'm not sure what other people would call it. You're scanning. You started at the top in your color flow. You can see it. This is actually um, probably the ICA. You don't see anything. There's no flow there. There's no jugular vein coming down. Now you're up above the facial tributary, okay? You're high. There's nothing there. You come down a little bit farther, you see this is the actually the left facial coming down, okay? You come down a little farther, this is the left facial dropping into a jugular. There's no flow in that jugular. Normally you see this facial, like uh, in the prior image, you'll see the left facial come down and drop into the jugular. There's no flow there because the flow is totally coming at this point from the facial vein. There's no flow above it. It's coming in from the facial. You go down farther, it's coming in from the superior thyroid. It's coming in lower down from the mid-thyroid level. This is, to me, very important, because especially when you're doing flow volumes. If you took your flow volume up higher, okay, you're just getting the flow from the left facial vein. You do it lower, you're getting flow from the left facial the, in the two thyroid veins. Okay? You're not getting any flow from your sigmoid, because there's no flow up there that we can see. Okay, so it does make a difference at your levels that you take these. Okay. Here's your longitudinal color. Here's your bidirectional flow. The bidirectional flow will usually be along the wall. What happens is, for whatever reason, it could be an obstruction, stenosis, um, whether it's your um, thyroid coming in at the wrong angle. Your vein, like I said, waxes and wanes. It's not like an artery. In an artery, they say, oh, okay, the flow backs up. You'll see it all through it. No, this vein wall will open up. The velocity is still coming down the vein, but the, the force of it coming back up, okay, for the bidirectional flow is slower. So, but it's still enough force to open up that vein wall. So you got the bidirectional flow going down, coming up. Okay. And we need to time it, okay? Especially if you're near um, the valve because you can get natural rebound. As the valve closes, the blood hits it and it rebounds back until it can open up again. So that's natural rebound. So we want it more than 0 0.88 seconds. We put a, a spectral analysis down um, and we measure, okay? So this is 1024 for your measurement, for time measurements. We also do, we do at just below the facial entry, um, which we call upper, because we're just looking at the Doppler now. 
um, mid-level, which is about the level of your thyroid and uh, superior thyroid entry, and then we do it just above the valve, and we take um, your, our time average velocity, and we also take our volume. Our time average velocity is over four seconds. We use the whole four seconds. It's not just one heart rate. This is a very important factor, and I think this is um, um, what complicates things for people when they do these studies. When you're doing, looking for, hmm? when you're looking for reflux or bidirectional flow, someone who's used to doing carotids would take this picture and say, it's a lovely picture, there you go, nice flow. Your PRF here is way too high, okay? You're not seeing, but you see this black here, so what's going on there? You lower your PRF, and their PRF is lowered, your scale is lowered, and you can see there's actually bidirectional flow there. So your PRF is very, very important when you're doing these studies. Um, and you lowered it so you can actually see there's aliasing here. This is called aliasing. This is the bidirectional flow. Your PRF is almost constantly, your finger's almost constantly on it. You're constantly changing it so that you can assess it. This here is grayscale, you're assessing the valve. Here's a valve leaflet here, here's the other valve leaflet here. And you can see one valve leaflet's going down and the other, can I make it go again? There. It's an inverted leaflet, okay? Doesn't mean it's incompetent. This can be perfectly competent, but right now there's an indication that might not be. None of our studies we do with Valsalva maneuver. When you're, look, when you're doing a uh, valve competency, you have to use Valsalva. All these studies are done at rest. When people say to me, oh, a lot of people have incompetent valves. No, they have incompetent valves under pressure, under stress. These are all done at rest, okay? So there's the, there's the difference. Okay. Here's now um, what we'll get back to, why we measure the color and not just the lumen. Here's an example of a longitudinal color flow, okay? You can see something's here, something, why is this not filling with color, okay? So we bring them up, you go in transverse, you're getting the same type of effect. This is blank, this is black, okay? If you were to measure the lumen, you would measure it like this, when actually, this is the flow. This patient on went on to IVUS, and there was a septum there stopping this flow. IVUS showed it exact location, okay? So this is why we always measure just the lumen, the flow, never just the lumen. Okay, now you have to assess your valve for function and mobility. I think this was a good one that Dr. Scalfani showed yesterday. This is actually, a, we, I term these because there's no actual terms, I call it a tethered leaflet. Can you make that go again or no? Nope. Yeah, okay, thank you. As you can see, this leaflet is not moving much. It's waggling back here. The flow is going around. You can see that leaflet being held there. Even with that pressure of the blood flow coming down, it won't open up. It's actually tethered to the wall, okay? So it, the flow can get through, but it can't get totally flew through. So that's a tethered um, leaflet. And that does cause bidirectional flow. This is when we're looking for collateral circulation. You can see how small the jugular is there. So we have our patients take breath in and out. Okay, deep breathing we call it. And what's happening is this collateral is responding to the breathing, not the jugular. So I call the jugular and supine the primary pathway outflow. The primary pathway is now this collateral because it's totally responding. Okay. Now we're moving on to assess the vertebral veins. And you do that on both sides, by the way, jugular and then the vertebral, you do these on right and left. We assess vertebral vein in um, longitudinal for bidirectional flow or no flow. 
Um, usually we, t we take it between C2, 3, 3, 4, or 4, 5. Usually it's between 3, 4, or 4, 5. You, between the processes. This is a process, this is a process, you get it because it's nice correlation with the artery there and you get it in good for form. This, in all our studies, and I've done probably over 2,000, I've seen reflux in a vertebral vein twice. Okay, so it's very rare. Um, reported no flow. I think no flow is, it does happen more often, but also because you're not, they're not assessing with their PR, PRFs very well. So I will bring that up later. I show you some images for that. Um, okay, so vertebra, we also take the velocity, volume, and we look at the waveform. The, in supine, the vertebral vein is very pulsatile. It's because it's not the main pathway and it sits right on top of an artery, so it's getting the reverb from the artery. So you're getting this nice pulsatile waveform just from the artery reverberation. Okay, I'm going to show you. Again, your PRF, your settings. This is actually, okay, the vertebral artery. This is actually the vertebral vein right here. There's no flow. I've seen numerous times where people say, oh, it's, there's no flow there, it's blocked. If they would change their PRF, there's lots of flow there. It just, it's just so f slow of a flow in supine position that they haven't lowered the PRF, so it's right there. Okay. Um, I don't think I have. Deep cerebral veins. Some people like them, some people don't. Um, some people are eliminating this. I, I personally think it's a mistake, but it's very difficult exam to do, so I can understand, you know, it's better to do a correct exam than get an error in the exam. You have to sit and this is actually the position. When we look at the, I call them the anterior deep cerebral veins, so we're looking at the petrosal veins and the um, condylar um, veins. So when you line yourself up, there's actually landmarks you can use to, to assess this. But you can use your um, two megahertz probe. These are the main vessels you're looking at, the cavernous, what is it, yeah, and petrosals. You're looking for bidirectional flow. And you look on the right and left side, not just one side, okay? And you're looking at these vessels right here. Okay. Rosenthal. Rosenthal's are very simple to get. Um, this is your midbrain right here in grayscale, and they're gonna come right along. They run right next to the artery, same time. They, they run their own course. They can be um, medial between the midbrain and the artery, or can be lateral to the artery. They can come, they're usually, majority of the time, run right beside them, but they can run out here, a little bit more separate from it. They come down from the thalamus area and then down towards the um, midbrain. So you can actually follow this and goes right into the gallon vein. Okay, and on these, we also take velocities and RIs. Again, for diagnostic, you wouldn't have to do that. And this is, we use a periorical win window. This is the ear, it's right above the ear. When you've done all that assessment, now you change your pos patient position to upright. You're doing this, you have to again wait a minimum of two minutes before you start your scan again upright position, you're going to go through the whole process again, except when you're doing your um, CSA. Your CSA, you're going to go right back to the spot that you marked when the patient was in supine position, because you want to compare apples to apples, so you don't want to move off where you were. So in this patient, okay, again, I picked this, this patient because you can notice I had to lower the PRF so low to try and even visualize this jugular. But you notice here, these are thyroid collaterals. They're actually veins, okay? So I lowered it so low so I could get this jugular even to get a uh, measurement on it. And then when we um, put the person in upright, then you could see it very well. Here's a five, here's an eight. It, it's actually negative three, the machine doesn't do the decimal points, but it's negative 2.29. So that's a positive parameter because it's negative, should be a positive number. Again, this is just some samples you're gonna go through. You're actually gonna do, well, whatever your protocol is, we do an upper, mid, and lower 
um, again in upright position to see the change in the velocity and the change in the volume. It's just a sample. Again, you're going to do it in the vertebrals. I'd like to point out that this waveform, see these vertebrals? Nice monophasic now. Before it was all phasic because it was on the artery, wasn't the primary pathway. Now it's the primary pathway, outflow pathway in the upright position. So you get this nice monophasic flow. I can tell you some of these patients have still pulsatile pro flow, but the volume's there, the velocity's there. We don't know what's going on yet. We're still investigating to see what's going on with some of these patients that have that. Again, you're going to do your deep cerebral veins, both sides, right and left. Your Rosenthal. This one I had to put in only because I have seen so many scans. We have a lot of patients coming from all over the world, and they bring their scans with them. And they say, please look at this. So I look at their scans, and I can't tell you how many times I see this. Longitudinal gray scale. They'll take a picture, a measurement, okay? AP diameter and longitudinal upper. Then go down to the lower and take another AP diameter, okay? So you got 12.86, and they'll come up with a result that they have 51% stenosis. That is just astronomical because, <laughs> for one thing, most people, you know, the, the valve is natural if for it to bulb out, and especially with age. It bulbs out even more with age. Anterior, yeah, in the upper part, you only have the sigmoid coming down, and this is above the facial, so you have one little stream. As the other vessels enter in, obviously you're going to dilate more because you have more pressure, more flow coming in. So don't do this, please. <laughs> this is totally wrong. Okay, and just a reminder, when you're dealing with your patients, they are MS patients, they may need pillows under their knees, they need armrests. If you put them in a stretcher, the, their arms are flopping, they get restless, they get agitated, their blood pressure goes up. You're trying to keep them at rest. Try and make them comfortable. They need to be warm. So please have consideration with for all your patients because um, it will affect the flow. And thank you. <laughs>